for YouTube. Um, yeah, so we kind of came together um, because you took the Connected Kids program. And I think yeah. after reading your case studies, some of the young people you were doing them with who were in care, I was really in awe of what I read. So, um, and then we had this idea, didn't we, that we would have these conversations about helping kids with trauma and who are in care using mindfulness and meditation skills and I'm also a foster mum, I forgot to say that. So, um, you know, so I think that we both feel that we could have a helpful, maybe a practical conversation about this uh, with a particular theme each time. And the theme you can see for today is contact. And we were just having a general chat about that <laughs> before we came online. Yeah. And, uh, you know, speaking personally, I, I think it's one of the most challenging, contentious um, for me, it was, um, experiences you know just really difficult the expression between a rock and a hard place you know yeah. um so we thought today we would uh, but there are still things we can bring to that in terms of our meditation mindfulness practice background and experience so I think that's what we were going to cover today um and we were thinking about it you know there's so many different uh, people involved um different perspectives that that brings as well. So we've got professionals who work with kids in care like Hazel. We've got people like me who is a foster mom as well as all the other kind of um, mindfulness online training things I do. Um, but then I've got my foster son who's here and his perspective. We've got uh, birth parents, um, you know, have I missed anyone Hazel? Was there someone mm -hmm. else? I suppose it affects teachers and everybody, doesn't it, really, as well, at the, at the end of the day, when children are maybe getting worked up before contact or mm. after contact. So the, yeah, so behaviour changes and things. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, so there's there's quite a lot of different people can be affected and have a perspective of, um, you know, contact as well. So I think we were going to just maybe take that particular approach to it. I mean, I... You've obviously experienced young people having to have contact. And we were just talking about the there is a legal right, you know, when children go into care. Uh, it depends on the individual children and their development, whether they can choose. Um, you know, um, some children choose not to see their birth family because they have at their looked after care meeting, they've expressed that, so that's taken into account. Um, others, because they're younger. They don't seem I, I'm taking that, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interpretation of it that they don't have the um the capacity to make that decision. So it's made for them. So they continue to see, you know, a birth family um mm -hmm. until maybe they can choose whether or not that's the right thing for them. And yeah. um yeah, so I don't know. <sighs> You know, for me, as we I was just saying to Hazel there, one of the difficulties I've had when young people have um, contact is that there is this legal right. However, um, it's really difficult to watch a young person get very distressed and upset, both pre, sometimes during, sometimes not, and certainly after, you know, a contact. And so you kind of witness them making good progress, developmentally you know their schoolwork, friendships and everything and then that huge amount of stress comes in for them because they don't know how to handle it maybe that's my interpretation and then afterwards it kind of it's a bit of a fallout and it, it's really upsetting to see that um that's certainly been my experience sometimes it's been very positive you know I've I've seen a connection made that it's almost reassured that young person that the person who brought them into this world still exists and is still yeah. there and that's very important to them what would you say about contact hazel from your perspective yeah well as we were kind of discussing earlier because we ended up chatting more about it didn't we Lorraine as well but yeah there's always two sides isn't there well there's lots of sides in this as well I mean as we were saying the research kind of says that in the long run, it is good for children and teenagers to have contact. And everybody will be going, no, it's not, you know, <laughs> in many circumstances. But as we were saying, you know, that kind of, like you touched on there, that sense of identity, where mm. do I come from? Who am I? Do I look like my parent? 
do I have similarities to my parent? You know, where do I get this from? All these things that creates that sense of identity for that child or young person, doesn't it? So you can understand their curiosity of wanting to see their parent. Mm -hmm. There's a real curiosity towards that. And I have over the years, because I've been in, worked in the same place for a long time, I have witnessed a young man who has now struggled over the years and continued with contact, but now can see his mum in a different light. He is very thankful and very grateful to his carers that he has now, his foster carers, very appreciative of them. And because he's had real positive role models, as they say, you know, in his life, I think it's it's had such a good, a, such a good outcome for him. He's mm. such a brilliant young man and he can see his mum and he can see that his mum struggles and he has empathy for her, etc. but he doesn't wish to live with her. He's happy where he is. Mm -hmm. Whereas, as I was saying to you, Lorraine, you know, a lot of our children and teens when they kind of hit 16, they want to be, I don't want to be seen to be in foster care. Mm. I don't want to be seen to have care experience. I want nothing to do with that whatsoever. And I want to go back and live with my family. And sometimes that can be because they've maybe not had contact, you know, or they've had, they've had little bits of contact, sporadic, you know, but Whatever, I would say definitely we need to make a strong case. If that is impacting the child when they're going for contact like you, Celerine, I think we need to be really, really careful and really noticing that and bringing our own mindful awareness to that mm. as well. Not just making assumptions, but actually being curious and finding out from the young person. Because we see the behaviours but let's think about ways how we can actually get them to express how they feel. Well, before we do that, though, remember we were saying, you know, that there's a there is a temptation, perhaps, when people are listening to this um, recording, for them to go, OK, tell me what to do when we've got mm -hmm. contact then so I can help them through it. And they can not be so, you know, like blow up at me when they come back from contact or get so stressy and shouty at me before they go to contact. You know, so there's this this kind of desire to want to fix the problem yeah. and um both uh hazel and i kind of know that the, the only way you start by helping that young person is supporting yourself first with your own kind of meditation and mindful practices and i, I want to dispel any myths there are about <laughs> meditation mindfulness as being you know you're going to have to join some um, kind of particular religious group to practice this the, the landscape has changed so much now you know there's wonderful free apps like insight timer um that you can download onto your phone um youtube has a multitude of like different meditation styles and things and the seated meditation style isn't for everyone you know you might have a hobby that you really like to do and bringing a bit more awareness to you doing that hobby the joy it brings you is an act of meditation in my book so you know, you might actually be doing something and not even realise you're meditating, but you it's an act of self-care. So you really need to to up that as a foster carer, I would say, yeah. um, to cope with, because it can be very difficult, you know, and, and challenging at times. Um, for me, you know, the, the biggest thing when it comes to contact is recognising my own prejudices that I have. Um, I think that's it's really difficult to even say that out loud, but that's the truth of it. Um, you know, as a, I use my meditation practice to kind of really witness what I feel about even the 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 whole. Um, I was going to say act of contact, you know, because I I think that there's this confusion in me about why why is this necessary? Why does this need to happen? Because all I see is burnout and fallout and stress and anxiety, and going back six steps when we've made some progress, you know. So this is my perception of it, and this is what yeah. we're saying by everyone's different perceptions. So one of the things um, I like to do uh, to support me with that is to to recognize that I need to up my self-care so if there is a hobby or something I like to do you know then I need to really make sure I've got access to that if there's um 
a friend who can keep confidence who, or maybe it's one of your secure you know you have your your family and friends that as a carer you have access to maybe you just need to have a conversation with them about how you're feeling um not projecting onto the birth family not projecting onto the kid just how you honestly feel about the situation what what is your feelings about it and then accepting that all those feelings whatever they are anger guilt shame you know um etc cetera, etc cetera, are valid you know you're allowed to feel them it's not you're not a bad person because you feel those things that's how you feel and that's okay um and then sometimes for me um it's maybe a bit of a I want to say mindful swearing. I maybe talked about this in the last podcast. But, you know, I've really, as a premenopausal woman who has, you know, a surge of hormones every now and again, I find mindful swearing, which you might think is an oxymoron, um, is really helpful because it helps me articulate and let go of and it's not towards anyone it's not directed at anyone and no one can hear me I usually when I'm out in the hills walking my dogs you know but it's it's a way of me just allowing myself to feel it and to let it pass so that I'm not then going to if I contain it what will happen is that I will then project it onto the people around me of which are usually the children in my care yeah. you know and they'll get the brunt of it because I'll be using that angry filter to perceive them coming back from contact and then it's it's a bit of a it's, it's very difficult because then you as I was saying earlier you step into the tornado with them and you get drawn into that drama and then it's very difficult after that yeah. you know you're just and very reactive that's what I was saying as well Lorraine is you know it provokes so much fear for everybody, doesn't it? The mm. word fear just always comes up when I think of contact. You know, mm. everybody's fearful around it. Everybody's fearful of actually saying what they think sometimes about it, um, you know, because you're going to upset people. So that fear and anxiety is all round about there for that child or young person as well. And they're picking up that energy, really, aren't they, mm. from, from the foster carer potentially from the worker potentially who's maybe taking them there yeah. from the um you know the parent and then their own fear of rejection or you know all these feelings that are that are there that are all fearful feelings aren't they for everybody mm-hmm. um and it's it's our job as the adults to try and you know get rid of that fear or help mm. that a little mm. bit for that young person isn't that as well or well see I don't know if I agree with that because I think it's about acknowledging that you have that fear and it's very normal to feel that that anxiety and stress I think one of the things we've got to be aware of is so I, I read a statement last week which I thought was really cool it said thoughts are real but they're not necessarily true yeah and I was just like oh my goodness yeah that's a great way so you know you have a young person yourself as a carer you're stepping into that I have to say if I use words like battlefield but that's how it feels yeah you know and um so you start to then you know put your guard up and your you know button down the hatches and and just not wanting to be hurt and upset for yourself um, and on behalf of the young person as well so it is really important I think to to acknowledge what those fears are and it might be that one of the practices you know I'm just going to suggest this that carers do is to talk about that with their young person or to at least go I have a whole bunch of fears in association with this it's not because of anything you say or do it's it's because of these are mine these belong to me but maybe you're feeling some of these too and then you can have this kind of hopeful I would call it a mindful chat you know but this opportunity to hear what this young person is feeling because it might not concur with what you're feeling it might be completely different they might be very excited and hopeful and just you know and nervous and you know yeah they they might have a completely different interpretation and it's, so it's important when you're sharing these things mindfully that you're not doing it to project onto them and make them think the same thing as you. It's to say, this is how I feel and I have to take responsibility for it and work through it. So 
Yeah, I, yeah, totally. I mean, that's in mindfulness terms. It's totally the wrong thing that I say to get rid of feelings because that is not what we do. But that's mind. okay. That's okay because it's such a normal <laughs> phrase that we use. Yeah. It? yeah, it's like yeah, that's the point is to mindfully challenge each other. And not yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We manage our feelings, don't we? We don't. We never get rid of them. We just we manage them basically, and we're trying to help our children manage their feelings more as well because we can't get rid of how they feel and we shouldn't and a lot of them I think just swallow down their feelings don't they and they don't see it you know what what they are feeling etc at all well you know they, they really don't one practical thing I would always say as well just popped into my head there is you know always have a plan b <laughs> certainly for contact as well because yeah if somebody doesn't turn up show up or whatever or various things happen always have a plan b of an activity that you're going to do with that young person Mm -hmm. don't just take them home and also i would suggest never just take them home either go and do something go out for a mindful walk go out for a scavenger hunt with some younger ones or something as well and get them to pick up things and be very mindful mm-hmm. of you know what they're seeing and what they're feeling and touching and smelling and you know just giving that bit of a break from rather straight from yeah that's a good point to home you know where you just like you get on with what you've got to get on with dinner to make whatever to do and they go up to the room or they do or they go and play with somebody and then end up kicking hitting you mm. know you, you see all the behavior so I would try and do some kind of mindful activity as a break in between like kicking a ball you know like taking them yeah. out to the park just kicking a ball over and over again um or I know or you know that being outside being in you know in some way that's not enclosed inside your know, nature uh, if you've got access to that um, or even just like you say taking a ball kicking it against a wall over and over and over again or I had a wee boy who when we went I took him a dog walk it was one of those experiences contact was meant to happen didn't happen huge disappointment and anger and um, I took him on the dog walk uh, in fact there's a there's a walking meditation called a labyrinth near me. So I recommend taking them to labyrinths because it's a really good way to calm down the nervous system. So look that up um, if you want to uh, find a labyrinth near you. But it wasn't just that. It was also the he was picking up stones and he was throwing them. And I saw him doing it. Now, as an adult, you may go, oh, don't throw stones, you know. I actually said to him, do you want to is that helping so do it really do it like really don't don't try and hit anything just throw it to get rid of what you're feeling and thinking Mm. at the moment you know just put it all into the rock and throw it as hard as you can and it wasn't you know there was nothing around it was just you know there was open space he was just doing it to and it, it just helped move you know his body it helped him to express it it helped him to own it you know, by knowing that it was okay to do that, he wasn't hurting himself or anything else. So it was like, why not? You know, well, as we say, isn't it? It's all right to be angry because every single person gets angry. It's just how yeah. we deal with the anger. Yeah. We need to help yeah. them manage that anger. You yeah. know, and how they express it. And that's that's the best way, isn't I, it? But I think a lot of adults are scared of anger. I yeah. think because we don't really know how to manage that ourselves. You know, we've grown yeah. up from children to teenagers to adults, and nobody, you know, was guiding us necessarily no. um, to accept that anger is a normal function of yeah. being human. And this is how. Here are your choice of options about how to process it. You know. Yeah. And um, and to also make sure that kids don't feel sh- you know, shamed or shameful about the fact that they feel angry as well. Um, yeah. I mean, we had that quite recently, you know, teenage boy, and uh, a lot of hormones and different things kind of going on and and outbursts. And I've actually said to him, you know, look, this is here's a choice of things that you can think about one of which is he's got a bean bag in his room and I was like just punch it just yeah. hit it as hard as you want I don't care yeah. about the bean bag I care about you about us about everyone else in this home you know yeah. so just just absolutely you know hit and scream if you need to I don't mind yeah you know, just do it if you have to yeah. just to get that out and, and I think sometimes people have this idea that oh my goodness but if you let if you open Pandora's box you never get it closed again but actually yeah. it's not that it's a fire that burns itself out 
I think you know, so too. It, yeah, it stop, if you stop giving it oxygen, yeah, it just it goes out. You know, you can't sustain it. So that's another. You know, but but helping them see that. You know, and maybe having a conversation with them after that experience to say, you know, this is, you know, learn about what happens in the body when we express things that way. Learn about how the brain works. You know, there's lots of training and free training and information about brains and nervous systems now. And I'm not in any way trained in that, but I I read and I learn a lot. And so if you're able to put that into really, you know, um, simple terms that a young person can understand then they don't feel bad about themselves they exactly. see that this is actually no wonder I felt like that no wonder yeah. I wanted to do that because yeah. you know otherwise they'll go around and they'll kick your dog or your cat or yeah it's when you see yeah. all the behaviors you know and so many a uh, prosecutors that you know I've spoken to when contact starts again you know, it's maybe stopped or for some reason it restarts or, you know, whatever. And then they just say, wow, the behaviour is just what we're witnessing in the, in the house is just incredible. You know, it's just swearing, hitting out, lashing out, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff. And again, I think, as you say, we can kind of understand that, really, if we yeah. think about it as well. But let's think about ways of how we can get the children to express or manage that better yeah. you know? and don't think yeah don't think it's just going to be a one experience and they'll no. get it they, you no. know young people need this as same here they need that that message you might find yourself just kind of saying the same thing in slightly different ways over and over yeah. and over and over again yeah. you know to give them the and and bringing it up again when it's not heated you know um, like car journeys and, and just saying you know how's things since then yeah and and having a conversation about that and then re reinforcing that there's a choice about how you manage that when that happens what you felt was normal but yeah. the action and you took afterwards exactly and the fear just popped into my head again another fear for the young people but younger children obviously as well is potentially am i coming back to you you mm. know mm. you don't necessarily know that they're they're possibly potentially being made to go and see a parent that they're unsure of they don't really know very well mm. um you know and then so there's no kind of am I coming back to you you mm. know that that separation anxiety you know what's going to happen here and there's lots of things you can do with separation anxiety and stuff as well you know give them something to bring back you know all these kind of things smells you know maybe give something with the smell of your perfume on it or something so you know to keep and hold with them mm. and stuff as well mm. you know little comfort or things that younger kids can take with them but just remembering that that's a fear potentially for them as well there's so many fears going on there and fears as well like we were discussing as well a little bit earlier as well I've witnessed a a young boy um go and see his parent his mum and her asking about the foster carers mm. and that kind of fear for him of what do I say here mm -hmm. you could see it all over his face and sort of looking to me as if to say what do I say because I'm you know am I going to put my foot in it here that I'm having a great time there or whatever you yeah. know as well yeah. and then potentially going back and the transitions again as well, isn't it? From moving yourself from one place back to another mm. set of rules and mm. somebody else and being asked, how was that? You know, so try not to put a spotlight on them, basically, and asking them questions, really, isn't it? Giving them that kind of space and time. And that's why I think it's good to do something in between mm. as well from going mm. back home. You know, just give that transition time. There's a lot of assumptions, I think, sometimes that we make about kids. And I think we do that because we are unaware of our own projections onto them. So if we have certain fears and thoughts and anxiety about contact. So I think that's why, you know, one of your practices that you can do, you know, sometimes it is like writing that down. You know, I talked about journaling. It's basically writing it down. Now, there might be an, a nervousness about people writing it down because that makes it real. But you you could burn it. You know, you could shred it. You could get rid of it once you've written it. But the, the act of writing it is really important because it helps 
remove the congestion, the mental and emotional congestion inside. And it can sometimes bring a lot of clarity and relief. That's what I'm feeling and thinking. I was going to suggest as well that when it comes to fears, although it's, it is a form of, I, I think it's a form of uh, mindful practice is tapping EFT, mm -hmm. emotional freedom technique. You know, it's, it's a particular, very easy way to learn how to um, reframe your thoughts about a situation or yourself or the people in it. And uh, there's a lovely little free app called Tapping Solution. Well, it's free for a period of time and then you, you have to pay for it. But there's loads of, again, free things on YouTube. And if you learn the basics of that, it goes hand in hand with, even if you are practicing some mindful awareness, it, it kind of takes the sting out of the strong emotions that you're feeling at the time that feel like they're just over riding you and you make you feel so ungrounded. And doing something like that, you know, um, just helps to, it just helps, it's like taking a, it's like pressing a reset button on your phone or on your computer and resets it. So you're not then getting, again, stepping into the tornado with your stuff and their stuff. And then it's all kicking off because you don't know. You I know, found that to, really helpful recently for me with a certain situation. I found EFT yeah, really yeah, helpful. Yeah. Uh, and and when, something. Well, I mean, once it takes the, the, the sting out of it, you know, it, it seems really silly at first because you're tapping your hands and face and different parts as you're thinking about the thing that bothers you. I mean, it, it's really it feels obscure at first, but then you kind of think, whatever, it works. You know, if it works, it works. Why not try it? Why not do something that helps me through this really difficult time and then afterwards it's like you've got the breathing space to if you do want to sit down and meditate on it or you know just be curious about what triggered you then you start to learn a bit more about your own triggers so that you can like we're saying to young people notice your triggers so you don't get drawn into a reaction with your anger yeah what are your triggers you know what's if it's contact do you get more antsy do you get more stress do you get more nippy do you get you know because that will come off in waves of energy their nervous system will pick that up yeah. and if you don't take care of it they're feeling it from you as well as their own stuff about going into a situation that they might feel very unsure of so the more yeah. you you develop even if you imagine yourself as a rock you know like something really solid for them then that could be very powerful for them to help them feel safe, I think. There's so many things, isn't there, that we can do, like that kind of, for a child imagining to have the shield or, you know, all these visual things for them to to protect their, themselves and their energy when they go yeah. somewhere and when they're, yeah. they're making that transition as well, you know. But, I mean, yeah, I've even seen me, you know, if I'm, taking a child, young person, whatever, and stuff as well. If it's younger ones, I've got bubbles and stuff as well. So it kind of would pop the bubbles as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, and yeah. that blowing out as well, kind of. So I just have that always, like, the little jar of bubbles in my car or in my bag or something. And sometimes it's just good for them to just blow it out a worry. Like you were saying with the stones as well, just chuck it out or yeah. just pop the bubbles or do something like that. Um, it's really, really simple. I've also had... Um, like said, you know, to foster care to get, like with the young person, the child and the young person, make up a playlist for going or for coming back. That's like for oh, young people. Nice maybe Disney songs or something that they love singing along to and stuff as well. Yeah. It just releases yeah. something as well, doesn't it? Just that voice, if they haven't been able to express what they're saying, I think the singing just really can get that. Well, there's a lot of research now into musical therapy about the effect on the brain and, oh, and using the voice. I was watching a programme on TV last night about dementia uh, sufferers yeah. where they're bringing in musical therapy to use the voice because it can it calms down the nervous system, it brings them joy, it helps and reduces anxiety. So what you're saying is absolutely spot on. You know, that yeah. would definitely make a difference. That's a great idea. I was going to say as well, um, oh... What was I going to say? See, perimenopausal brain can exist <laughs> at this point. Well, that was it. You know, um, the some of the stuff I want, I do actually want to mention some of the energy stuff that you're talking about there, because I know you've been on the programme. One of the things in our programmes, I talk about energy a lot. And even though you might think, oh, that's a bit woo-woo, not sure about that. Honestly, it's worth trying it, because I think 
what you've got nothing to lose by trying it at all and one of the the ones I really like when young people are going into situations I use it with my son actually when he's an aspect you know there's things kicking off at school he's feeling a bit unsafe or it's a bit challenging is um, I called it the golden spacesuit Mm. and um, so the golden spacesuit is the idea that your young person and you you can wear it too um, are wearing a golden space suit, a golden cloak, if they're into Harry Potter, you know, whatever way you want to dress them up in it. And gold is, to go into energy, or we're way more than just the physical body that we are. We have, we have these, we have energy that extends beyond the physical body. So we can almost like antennae, we can pick up on other things, which can be quite uncomfortable sometimes if there's a lot of stress and anxiety around. Um, if you think that's too woo-woo for you, um, there is research now that shows the limbic system in the brain picks up on the stress of others around us. So it is definitely um, a real experience that you can be affected by someone else's stress. But I this is an... in my bubble, Lorraine, sorry, quite often before yeah. I... Mm-hmm. Well, I was just going to come to you in a moment yeah, about being, a, you know, being involved in, in, in the professional side. But the bubble is basically to, to protect your energy to um to help us stay grounded and safe and to keep our nervous system calm and um and it's a wonderful tool to use uh for children for the carers and as you're just explaining there as the mm-hmm. professional yeah yeah or even you know just us all going to meetings and say i've done i've used it for a teenager going into a, a um, looked after review yeah. and stuff as well yeah. you yeah. know to help her actually cope and manage with that yeah. Um, I think if we should be trying a totally different subject but we should be trying to get our young people more involved in their own meetings and if we can find ways to do that mm. but yeah. yes but but one of the but sticking with contact because that's yeah. another thing <laughs> we did but sticking different. with contact contact is like one of these like t- difficult times and it's a lovely playful way to you know nobody knows that you're doing it you know they don't need to do anything obvious to the outside world you're just imagining yourself all the clothes that you've got are ton gold and it will have the effect of just creating a um uh an important like you said shield or protection of your energy it's not you're shutting the world out you're just you're just helping you move through this this difficult space uh, you know with a, a little bit more um protection and the the added thing to do if you can do this yourself i would advise it and also teach your kids is that the person who or the the people involved in the situation that makes them feel challenged get them to imagine that person dressed in pink okay pink is the color of the heart it's the color of love and whilst your your ego your thoughts are like i don't want to send them love but if you put that prejudice or thoughts to one side at the moment, just go, okay, if this helps the situation, I'm in gold or the, the kids are in gold and whoever they're going to meet is in pink. And there's an amazing effect that that does. It, it, it changes the, you know, the energy of love can really bring quite interesting change to that. It'll make a difference or it won't, but it won't cause harm. And I've recommended this so many times. I've recommended it to my son when, you know, there's maybe bullying going on at school, but particularly when contact, when that young person and you as well, you know, every time you think of them going into contact, think of the birth family in pink, think of them, think of the professionals in pink. You is the professional thinking of the whole group of people in pink as you're in gold you know so don't put gold on someone else don't imagine them just think of them in pink and that is a a really um simple energy tool to use that is using your mindfulness skills because you're using your imagination to yeah I've certainly used it myself like I say and it's certainly worked for me yeah it's amazing isn't it it's really amazing yeah Mm -hmm. I definitely have the other thing I was going to say, I mean, do you want to say anything about as a professional then, any other tools you use to help you, not the children or the birth family per se, but just you and your role? Um, in contact or yeah, well, no, I suppose, I, I suppose obviously I'm always coming from the perspective of the children and the young people really mm-hmm. more than anything, you mm-hmm. know, and just always just trying to be aware. And what I would say is mindfulness has helped me tune in 
to the children mm. much more doing your course helped helps that you develop an awareness of how to tune into each child mm. so that you're not making assumptions but you can you you practice and you kind of know what what they need mm. at that moment in time almost mm -hmm. so having my own practice helps me so much in that as well you know with, with anything to do with work don't get me wrong I struggle sometimes like everybody you know but yeah. having my own mindful practice has been so helpful and I would definitely say it helps I mean I think I always kind of had that way anyway where I was able to tune into children and young people and you know being empathetic towards them and stuff as well but it, it definitely is a skill as well mm. I think in, in learning everybody can do it but it helps and yeah if you can find out what that young person's interested what they like doing you know that's that's massive that can really help because you know giving somebody a barbie doll or whatever is not going to help if that's not what they're into you know just mm. Like if a child's into art and expressing themselves through art, you know, you can find ways to to use that. And to just like and the way a very quick tip of how to turn a regular activity into a mindful practice is just to get them to tune into one of this the five senses yeah. and occasionally their breath. You know, um it depends on their age, whether how easy it is for them to focus on their breath. But certainly just tuning into a sense. Um, if though they have body dissociate dissociation, yeah. I can't see that. Yeah, if they have that because of trauma, yeah, because of trauma, then it, that's going to be more tricky, I think, to get them to do that. But you can, um, you can certainly get. Then I would move into the breath and get them to blow out, as Hazel was saying earlier, to really no notice the breath and blow out. But if you can get them to, um, just you know, draw their attention to something if they're holding a pen or pencil notice you're holding that and what's the color you know so just bringing their attention to the here and now of what's really real for them in this moment can start to bring to turn anything into mind even on their phones you know anything can be turned into a, a meditation a mindful practice um so that's yeah and I think you know you were saying there about the um you know the it's happened again. This no, I'm saying, I don't know why like Barbie doll came into my head. <laughs> oh my goodness. No <laughs> start, and then it's like, goodness, and then my, my train of thought drifts off. But it was you were talking about, you know, the um not making assumptions and being aware and having that practice and, and tuning into the needs. That was of yeah. the children. You know, if you some obviously younger children we understand that they can't articulate everything that they need yeah. you know that's the point of our caring and our parenting you know we look after them to help them develop the, the ability to do that hopefully but even when you get older you know uh, children and teenagers they can also find that difficult to articulate what it is yeah. that they need and to express that even ask for it so the ability to tune in comes because you have your own meditation practice so you're you feel inspired or intuitively you kind of go oh is it this or are you happens, you yeah. you ask questions that are open yeah. you know that that helps you help them to put into words or to express something yeah. that they're that there's a lot of confusion in their mind anxiety and stress causing that and you just help them get some clarity and we all know that if we've had a if we're confused about something and then we get our light bulb moment or insight we're like oh oh my goodness right and that makes sense and understanding brings compassion self-compassion compassion for others so yes being able to do that is really powerful um anything else you want to suggest for um again there's just so many things that you there's so many things that's the thing it's like but things that work for you or things that you've really yeah, enjoyed that, using that you haven't said the younger ones even just have kind of like you know some cloud watching you know even on the drive yeah. back or whatever just or going out to walk and just cloud watching and just looking at the clouds and just seeing what pictures they can see in it you know and then again just bringing them more into awareness of their environment how mm. they're feeling and then just say being able to say how do you feel and just now how are you feeling in this moment you mm. know and mm. actually because you've brought their 
their brain into the present moment, they're able to express it much mm. more rather, rather than their brains are all over the place, aren't mm. they? With the thoughts that are going on and the fears that are going on and the anxieties. So yeah, anything we can do to just bring them a bit of chocolate in the car or a bit of fruit or something. Which can be a mindful practice because you can get them to focus on, you know, yeah. um, what it tastes like, the sensation exactly. in their mouth, the smell of it where it pops in their mouth, you know, where it do came it really from. Yeah. 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 Talk about, you know, a mindful chat in the car about where did that come from, the milk from the cow, you know, everything can just yeah. really kind of change it. I was going to say that the, you know, for me, energy is really key. So if there's, um, oh, actually, something has popped into my head there's a really nice thing you can do when you're in a situation with someone who is really struggling and that might be between you and the young person it might be between you and your social worker it might be between you and the birth family if you happen to be taking a child there for them and um, I call it the figure of eight um, so it's an affinity symbol and so the way I do it is that it, I imagine light streaming out from my chest from my heart center and it goes around the shoulders of the person who I'm struggling with comes around my shoulders goes around them and I create this light of figure of eight around them and around me and that is a really again it's a wee bit like the gold and the pink light it's a lovely little visualization to use and it helps us keep our hearts open to each other you know it helps because one of the difficulties we have when someone is behaving in a way that we find very difficult is we want to ignore them shut them away don't want anything to do with you and really the more we do that the more that person's behavior gets amplified because they can energetically they can feel it when yeah. we keep our heart open we don't need to take on their stuff just a little you know lovely little figure of eight um between you and them and teaching your kids to do that as well when they go into contact and a little visualization you know um can be a really nice way for them to cope and be you know be okay being in a place that might usually unsettle them uh, so that can be a helpful little kind of mindful energy tool to use as well yeah 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 great well that has been lovely chatting to you as normal hazel i do Thank enjoy you. your chats i hope everyone's found this helpful if there's any questions you have about any of the things that we've said please just get in touch uh, you're listening to this on the facebook page uh, the facebook group or perhaps it's on youtube um, so you can have, you know, put a question up or make a comment, um, you know, whatever you need to do. And if, if there's something you'd like us, you know, to cover that we haven't covered already, then please let us know. Um, we're happy to do these. We do them monthly and um, we find that, um, I don't know about you, but it certainly gives, reminds me and gives me clarity as well, being a foster mom. You know? yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what yeah. I've, I've that that helps with that you know uh -huh. kind of thing so it's i'm really grateful that we get the chance to chat this way so absolutely yeah no it's really good to chat and catch up and hopefully like you say Lorraine, it helps somebody in some little form or another <laughs> good stuff so i'm just going to stop the live stream now and i will also 